Hello and welcome to another edition of On the Line, Perspectives on Partition with me, Paul McFadden. This series, which is organised by the Bloody Sunday Trust, invites people from diverse backgrounds to share their thoughts on one of the defining events in modern Irish history, the partition of the island 100 years ago, and on things which have come to pass in the century since then. Our guest today is a former journalist, a determined caseworker with the Pat Finucane Centre, author of two acclaimed troubles-related books, Holy Cross, The Untold Story, and Lethal Allies, British Collusion in Ireland. Anchor Water, welcome to the series. Uh, I, re I recall the late uh, Seamus Heaney saying uh, about his art form uh, in an interview in RTE many years ago, that, that poetry had to be able to bear scrutiny. And that's certainly true of, of work like yours. You'd be confident, wouldn't you, that Lethal Allies, in particular, if I single that out because it's a hugely successful publication, you'd be confident that Lethal Allies will bear scrutiny, that it will stand the test of time historically. Yeah, I mean, it is seven years since it came out, well, and nearly eight years, actually, unbelievably. And yes, it has stood the, the test of time. It was the first book, to my knowledge, that was used as an exhibit in the High Court. And I know for a certain fact that um, lawyers in this town have been asked to go through it with a fine tooth comb and find discrepancies and inaccuracies, and they have failed to do so, um, as have others. Um, to date, nobody has laid a finger on the book and the facts in the book. And for that, I pay, pay great credit to my colleagues in the Pat Finucane Center upon whose research the book was based. I just took their work the pages and pages, piles and piles of paper and documents and records and facts and figures and what they had found out from talking to people and put it into a, a form that was, one hopes, reasonably comprehensible to the average reader. And it was a great privilege to be asked to do that. And it has stood the test of time. And if I do nothing else for the rest of my life, it will be my legacy to the people of Ireland. Yeah, I think it's something that uh, any journalist will be immensely proud of, and uh, every journalist I imagine in Ireland is probably very envious of you, ha having, you know, collaborated, yes, with the people at the Pathfinder Centre, but you're the person whose name is on the book, and it's an immense, uh, an immense job of work. Was there anything in it, you know, that particularly surprised you, you, you know, you, you came... It all surprised me, Paul, because although people, when I was a journalist, people thought that I believed in collusion. I didn't. I believed that it was possible, but I didn't believe that there was collusion. I was a doubting Thomas, the ultimate doubting Thomas. I had to see evidence. I had to feel it and see it and touch it. And until I did, I did not believe in collusion. I was very hard to persuade. But once I was persuaded, and it was deeply shocking, and it took a long time for it to sink in, and it could be proven. I, I, I mean, uh, there was a point in writing of the book where I thought it was possible that collusion had happened, but was it possible to prove it? And I didn't think it was, but by the time I finished the book, writing the book, I was convinced that it was A, it did happen, and B, it could be shown to have been happening. I think that's the surprising thing about Lethal Allies, not not that we that we prove that we showed there was collusion, but that we we proved it. We proved it, and the High Court and others and police officers and lawyers have gone through that book trying to disprove it, but they can't. It is impossible to disprove it because it happened, and it happened to people, and it was tragic, and terrible, and wrong, and corrupt, and disgraceful. What what was it like at that moment? You know, when the penny dropped for this doubting Thomas. I mean, how, how did you feel at that moment? You realised that you know th th this stuff has happened, and and of course later you see the scale of it, and and you, you see that it can be uh, a, a pr proved to have happened. But that first moment when you, as as a, as an English person, realised that this kind of thing happened in Northern Ireland. Well, I felt. I felt greatly ashamed and because my father was a British soldier 
So was my mother. So was one of my sisters. My brother was a police officer. I believed, I believed that Britain was the mother of democracies and the British way law and order was, was beyond reproach. And it was deeply shocking and very shaming, especially when I knew the results, the outworkings of it, the people whose lives it had touched, not only touched, but destroyed. So yes, it was a dreadful, dreadful realization. Um, and it happened, only, it happened gradually, but once you've lost trust in an, in an institution, or an organization, which I did, you can never get that trust back. And I guess I'm naive because I still, I still am incapable really of plumbing the debts that the state went to. I still can't even look into that wound. I still recoil from it because it is just repulsive to me. I can say no more than that, Paul. May I ask you, you know, in, in, in a sense, I'm, I'm sort of probing something that's very private, you know, um, but may I ask you what, how, how your family reacted to the, the findings that you and your colleagues uncovered? Well, my parents are both dead. So I can only imagine. Um, I would imagine, I would hope that my father would be as shocked as I am. I would hope that and my mother and um, my brothers and sisters who are still alive, um, support me in, in, every, in what I do. I don't talk to them. I talk to what, I have a sister that I'm very close to and she has helped me and she has come along to meetings that I've spoken at. And when I was in New Zealand, I went on a speaking tour of Australia and New Zealand. And when I was in New Zealand, I spoke at the University of Auckland and um, my youngest sister who lives there came along to that meeting. Um, and I think they, I think they support me. Um, they've never said anything other than, than that they do. Um, and people that I'm friends with or have been friends with since university, who would be like, who would think like me, who would not imagine that the state could is capable of doing the things that we now know it is capable of. They found it quite shocking too, but I think there is a great sense in the British population of, of an inability to come to terms with what they've done in Ireland over the centuries. And there is also a racism in Britain, which regards the Irish as comic figures, leprechauns, you name it. And there is a deep rooted racism in Britain about Ireland. It's even more insidious in a way than anti-black racism, because I think people are now facing up to their racism when it comes to colored people, black people, Asian people. But when it comes to Irish people, they're still in denial. British people are still in denial. Many, not all, obviously, but some British people are still in denial about their anti-Irish racism. And I find that very difficult. I don't think I could ever live in England again. Because of that? Yeah, yeah. You, you came to, uh, to Northern Ireland in, in 1981, uh, during the, uh, well, around the time of the, the second hunger strike. How, how much of, this place did you know when you first came as I mean, absolutely you were, nothing you were born in london yeah yeah absolutely nothing i remember when i went when i was doing history a level you could opt to do um to do irish history but if you did that you'd have to get a, a new teacher and i went to a pretty exclusive girls boarding school they called it a finishing school in england and if I'd chosen to do Irish history, the school would have had to find a tutor from somewhere and bring them in because there was only about 30 girls in the whole school. So I didn't do Irish history at A-level. Um, so all I knew about Ireland, I knew, I knew a bit about Cromwell, 
I was aware that there'd been a famine, um, but that was about it. And I knew that there was bombs and soldiers getting killed in Belfast, but that was about it. I didn't know anything about Bloody Sunday. I thought that Bloody Sunday, and this was quite shocking when I found out, I thought on Bloody Sunday, there had been one single fusillade that a row of soldiers had faced rioters and had made, and there had been an instant mistake, and they had opened fire, and 14 people had fallen dead. And it had happened in a, in a second. It, when I discovered that people had been hunted down, followed, chased, and shot down over a period of, of a lot, much longer period, that was, that was a revelation. I wasn't aware of it. And if I didn't know, then there are millions of people in Britain who also don't know, probably even to this day, don't know what happened on Bloody Sunday. That's despite things like the Cameron apology and two inquiries, including, including one hugely expensive inquiry led by Lord. Yeah. By I Lord. don't think they, they don't realize the full extent of it, no. Tell us, what, what brought you to, to Northern Ireland in, in 1981? I mean, it's a strange time to have come here, you know, in one sense. For, for a young woman who grew up and had no real sense of history and, and uh, no great deep knowledge of what was happening here at that time. What, why Two you words. Think? Naked ambition. I was a young journalist starting out and Bobby Sands and the Hunger Strikes were the biggest story in the world. And when you're young and you want to make a career for yourself, you want to cover the big stories. So that's why I came to Ireland. Pure selfishness. That I wanted to come here and learn. Having said that, I don't think the selfishness lasted very long because once I was here, and I started talking to people and, and uh, traveling and listening and watching, um, I rapidly became very, very, very interested. And I only ever intended to stay six months and I'm here however 39 years later or however long it is. Yeah. It'll be 40 years this autumn. Uh, so, I, I mean, I intended to come over and make a name for myself and then go back to London and become a, a kind of foreign correspondent or whatever, but I got suckered in. I just fell in love with the place and I'm still here now. I mean, you, you worked for quite a number of, of, of media outlets in your, your time as a, a journalist. Um, and and you, you will have clearly, in, uh, in the time since then, picked up uh, quite a bit of knowledge and, and I'm imagining some opinions in relation to the, you know, the, the subject, which is the kernel of this entire series, the Act of Partition, 100 years ago. When, when you look back at that, you know, albeit with your initially limited uh, understanding of Irish history, and you, there's been a, a, a lot of learning done in the course of the steep learning curve since then, I'd imagine. When you look back to that act of partition, what would your impression be of it? Now that it was a terrible, terrible mistake, that it was yet again the failure of political leadership, particularly in London, and that the whole, all the people on this island have paid a terrible price for that terrible mistake. Um, I, I've, I, when I was young, I lived um, all over, well, not all over the world, but, but in a lot of different places. I lived in Germany. Uh, I lived in um, Oslo in, in Norway. I lived in The Hague. I lived in Indonesia. So I've lived in lots of different places. And there isn't a country I've lived in that hasn't got differences. There are differences between the North Germans in near Hamburg, where I lived, and the Bavarians. There are differences in even a small country like the Netherlands between the Amsterdamers and the Rotterdamers. There are differences in every country, but the differences don't break out as a rule into civil strife. And civil strife and violence is is the outcome of a failure of political leadership and i don't think the british ever cared enough about ireland to show that kind of wisdom and political leadership that this that the that, that, that the country required it was just on its back doorstep it was taken for granted um it was ireland britain's first colony and its last 
And partition was a terrible mistake, pure and simple. And how on earth we're going to resolve it now is the question. Yeah, but I, mean, um, I believe it can be resolved if if people put their minds to it. Yeah, you see, uh, part of the resolution of it then will will um, concern what one does with the the fact that there's a a sizable part of the population here who feel a very strong affinity to to Great Britain um, and have no desire to be part of a a 32 county Ireland, you know, so I mean, what what would you say, you, you talked about the act of partition having been something that, that uh, you portrayed it as something that would, have, that would have damaged all people of the island. What yeah. Would you, what, what would you say to people from the unionist community who have no desire to be linked in any shape or fashion other than, you know, having a, a, a good neighbourly relationship with the Republic of Ireland, they certainly don't want to be swallowed up within a 32 county uh, Ireland and, and feel a very strong sense of identity and kinship with people in Britain. Yeah, well, well, I think people in the South suffered from partition as well. You know, that there were two states created and both of them were, were, were kind of damaged from the start. But I think that the South has righted a great deal of its wrongs, right, has, has, has grown up. And a lot of the mistakes that were originally made, but I think, again, I think they were made because of partition because the two states became confessional states. Um, and of course, the way that the boundary was drawn around the six counties of Ulster in, uh, was, was based on a sectarian headcount. And it was a terrible, it was, it, was, uh, a, it was utterly wrong to have done it the way that it was done or to do it at all was wrong. Um, but but now you've got a, it's like the old story with a man with a with the U.S. tourist stopping an Irishman on the road and saying, "How do I get to court from here?" And the guy saying, "Well, I wouldn't start from here if I was you." The point is, we are where we are, and it's very hard to put right something that was so wrong. But it can be done. I mean, it, it can be done. I think. I heard today about a, a proposal. I think Tommy Bow, the rugby player, said that people should be traveling more across the border. There are still people, I mean, I when I went down to live in Dublin in the mid 1980s after working for the BBC for four or five years in Northern Ireland, I went down to Dublin and I didn't know what to expect. It was, it was different, but it was great. <laughs> it was great and people worked really hard. Um, I suppose I had a certain residual prejudice. I thought I wasn't sure what I'd find, but I'd heard people say that the, you know, I'd heard people say that the Irish were feckless, that they didn't work hard, that they enjoyed socializing too much, um, to use a euphemism. Um, but when I got down there, I found quite the opposite. People worked extremely hard. They were very efficient. Um, the economy was in trouble, desperate trouble, and so was society because of, you know, there was no contraception or divorce, um, and it was messed up in that way. But, you know, the people were great and lovely and hardworking and industrious, and I loved living there, and I just absolutely fell in love with it. Yeah. Um, and I lived there for the next five years very happily. I was, I was going to ask you uh, why you are and then I mean you went to this place that you enjoyed immensely. The, yeah. the, the messy things that you described in there uh, have of course subsequently been re resolved um, but, but ha having landed in Dublin and having been enjoying it immensely how do you wind up back then in, in, in the north? Well I guess it was um, it was a career move. I was offered the job of northern editor of the Irish press um, and that was, you know, three newspapers, the daily, the morning paper, the evening paper and the Sunday. And it was kind of my dream job, you know, to go back because I'd worked for the BBC up here. Then I went down, I worked for RTE and the Irish Press down there. And then I was offered the job of Northern Editor of the Irish Press. And it's not the sort of job you turn down. So I came back up here in 1991. I was only four months married when I came back up in 91. Um, and word for the Irish press and it was and then the peace process happened and the Irish press of course went out of business and I found myself without a job um, 
temporarily, but um, and my husband was living in Dublin and we went up and down. I mean, he and I criss crisscrossed the border. You can imagine for nearly 20 years, Jerry lived in Dublin and I lived in Belfast and we went up and down. We were a cross-border relationship. Um, and to me, from that, from the moment I went to Dublin and fell in love with the 26 counties and I came back up here to work in 91, for me, the border isn't there. I mean, I'm lucky in a way because for me, it's just, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Um, I also am lucky enough to have a wee place in Donegal, which I go to as often as I can, COVID permitting. And so for me, the whole thing is just, it's, it really doesn't exist, the border, in my mind. I mean, I have two purses, you know, one for sterling and one for euros, and that's about the extent of it, really. And I, I, I pay no heed to it. I mean, I think the border is in people's minds more than anything else. I would like to see, I mean, economically and socially and everything, I would like to see the count country reunited, because I think it would be better for all of us. But as far as myself personally is concerned, Ireland's already united in my mind. Okay, well, this, this, this person who's got the two persons and who crisscrosses the border and has a house in Donegal and, and all of that, what, and, and being a Londoner, uh, where, where people were as, you know, resolutely opposed to Brexit as, as, as people in the, the foil constituency where I'm sitting uh, were, um, what, what do you make of, of that, that action, uh, you know, well, I, you know, uh, from the European Union, I'm appalled. I mean, I, I lived in Europe. I lived in Paris and the Hague and Hamburg and Oslo, and and we travelled. My family travelled everywhere in, in in Europe, and I feel utter, completely European more than anything else, probably. Um, I and uh, I've travelled extensively throughout Europe. My Husband was the was the travel and tourism correspondent of the Irish press, so we got what you might what some people call freebies, but which I prefer to call press educational facility trips. Um, so I mean, I know I mean I've I've map read myself all around Europe, and when I lived in Paris, uh, I travelled all around France, Italy. I know like the back of my hand, Switzerland, Austria. I mean, I feel absolutely European, and this whole Brexit thing to me. Is, a, is an expressence. It's an appalling, terrible mistake. Um, I have a sister in Madrid. I have um, a niece in Paris. And I haven't been able to visit them because of COVID. But I mean, normally I would be in and out. And I speak French. And I, and I worked in Paris for a while. Um, so I feel completely European. And I, and I, I reject the whole concept of Brexit. Um, there's no doubt that Europe and European institutions could have been improved, but to turn your back on Europe, which I see the country as having done, and to sort of say that you're better than them is just ridiculous in my view. And it's caused a great deal of hassle from, you know, and unnecessary conflict um, in terms of the economy and everything. But, I think it's a hangover from empire. I really do. You know, I think Fintan O'Toole has written very well about that, that there's something in the British mentality and I don't have it. So it's hard for me to understand it, which says that, you know, we're, we're special, we're different. There's a bit of water between us and the French and therefore we're in some way better or superior. And I've never been able to understand that. And I never will. Part of the hassle, uh, that has ensued from Brexit, of course, as they, uh, there are unionist politicians who describe it in, in uh, much sterner terms than that, but is the Northern Ireland uh, Protocol, which has united many unionists, you know, who, who are demanding to see, demanding that it should be removed. We have Edwin Putz only this week talking about, you know, the fact that, that you're going to have people right across the community in Northern Ireland who are going to be facing uh, much steeper uh, grocery bills and things like that. And we have, huge implications for medicine supplies, for things like cancer drugs and, and all of that. Um, would, would you regard that as, would, do you have any sympathy at all for work? No, I think it's just scaremongering. Really? Yeah, I do think it's scaremongering. Now, having said that, um, I'm, a, I'm a, quite a keen gardener. <laughs> and there's certain, there was one particular 
rose that I wanted to buy my, was my mother's favorite rose and it's not available. I haven't been able to find this. I'm quite a key, as I said, this year, I was intending one thing I said to myself, I'd do this year is get this particular rose and plant it in my garden. And I haven't been able to buy it because the only person I, I found it online, but all the nurseries I've written off to who would normally deliver and last year did deliver, um, this year aren't delivering, but I think I can live with that, you know, I'll find one, I'll find one in Ireland one day, I think I can live with that. Yeah, but, but uh, living with the, you know, the, the rose is one thing, but if you are denied, you know, a, a critically important cancer drug, that's, that's a, a different order in, in terror. Yes, of course it would be. And, and sh surely you must have some sympathy if that is indeed the case, uh, with, with, you know, the, the, the unionist argument that, that the protocol it, it can't be justified. Uh, well, if, the, if it happens, yes, but I don't think that has happened to date. Um, and the problem is with, is with Brexit. Uh, the protocol is, is what has had to happen because of Brexit. Um, and there was, I think there was a certain mentality in Ireland um, that, that if Brexit, if, if people voted for Brexit, then the then the Good Friday Agreement would be overturned and the border would be re reconstituted, and I think that's why some people here did vote here. I, I here, I mean, in the six counties, I think that's why some people did vote for Brexit to roll back the advances that have been made. But in a, in the I mean, I, and people, and then this is where I would probably part company with a lot of people. I would see no problem with the United States of Europe. Why not? We'd all still, as John Hume used to say, French will still be French and the Germans will still be Germans. And a United States of Europe to me would make good sense. Why not? You know, uh, um, collaboration, working together, cooperation. We're, while we retain our distinct sense of identity, and I think that's perfectly possible. I mean, I've, I've traveled a lot in America. And when you're in Kentucky, you're in Kentucky. When you're in Texas and California, you're in very different places. And that's a country that is relatively new without the cultural centuries that, that the European countries have already got under their belt. And to me, the, the concept of the United States of Europe makes a lot of sense. Why not? I guess sometimes in, in this island that feels like we're in, I know some people would disagree with me on that. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. but, I, but I do think it's sometimes I say, no, it almost feels as though we're in two different time zones as well. I'm not talking about ours, I'm talking about um, almost centuries apart, you know. And, and I mean, one of the things that's striking in the course of this conversation from your time uh, in, in, in Ireland, North and South, uh, but, but in relation to w what's happened north of the border, has been there has been a, a immense change. I mean, you arrived here. And, and, you know, during some of the, the, the most violent years of the conflict, not the most violent 1972 was, but I mean, that, that era of the hunger strikes, a very, very an, an intensely violent period in our history. There has been a remarkable transformation yeah. since then. This happens almost so slowly that um, it's been almost imperceptible. But I know because when friends come to stay with me who haven't been here for a while, they say how, how very different the North is. But I, I mean... I can still remember, um, it's not that long ago, I can remember, um, I, I mean, I covered all the drum prees and uh, that they were absolutely nightmarish. And I can remember when people were, I hated it when people were killed and before they were buried, somebody else was killed. That's, you know, that sense that things were spiraling out of control. And there was a point, there um, more than one point in Belfast where you just didn't answer the front door where unless somebody had phoned you to say they were coming over to see you, you didn't answer the front door. I can remember traveling from here to Portadown once and seeing fires, smoke rising from villages and having to take detours when orange men or loyalists of one description or another stopped me on the road and told me to get away, go away and or to turn around and go back. Um, you know, I was, I can remember those days and how terrifying, utterly terrifying they were and how utterly depressing it was. I'd never attend, I'd never been to a funeral until I came to live in Northern Ireland. 
I didn't even go to my own grandmother's funeral. Um, the first funerals I ever went to were over here. Um, and I'd never seen a dead body before I came here. Uh, but I, I ended up seeing quite a few. I'm going to quite a few funerals. And I, you don't forget things like that. And I used to, in the old days, I sometimes used to give visiting journalists foreign correspondence. I did, did a pretty good tour of Belfast where all the things, places, and where things had happened. But I stopped doing it. Not, I stopped doing it because I could see in their eyes, all they could see was a perfectly ordinary street. Um, nothing special about it, but I could still see I could still see the blood. And so I decided to stop doing it because it was it was too painful and too awful that I could see what they couldn't see. So I stopped doing it. And I, I don't do tours of Belfast anymore. It's too upsetting. And I'll never forget those days. They were horrendous. And you won't forget them either, I'm sure, Paul. Absolutely. I mean, I'm just thinking back to the earlier part of the conversation, you know, um, you, you you sort of you you did uh, betray a, a a degree of optimism that that some kind of resolution could be found here. Uh, I mean, I'm just thinking about you. You were saying earlier on, kind of we are where we are, you know, and we are where you have this division over um, the Northern Ireland Protocol. You have people sort of questioning just the stability of the executive assortment and power sharing and and all of that. We have a marching season just looming on the horizon now. Do do you remain optimistic? And do you see, I mean, your, your long-term future, your, you, you don't imagine yourself living in Britain again. No. Do you see your long-term future here in Northern Ireland? Yes, and I mean, I would love, I would love to think that it will be resolved in my lifetime. I'm not sure that it will, but it is capable. I mean, I'm not a historical determinist. I believe that, you know, things are still fluid and it is possible that it can be resolved. Um, I don't know when, but it's absolutely possible to resolve it without too much agony on any either side. I'm not sure it will be or not. It, I see hopeful signs, um, but whether whether things will gradually work out the way that they they should, I don't know. Very briefly, are you in favour of a an early border poll or? <coughs> that that could be, could be problematic and possibly dangerous? Yes. Well, I think that people are, are beginning to think seriously and begin preparing for the possibility of a border poll. Um, there are, there's lots to be resolved, the health service, pensions, all of that sort of stuff. But that's, that's, that's possible. Anything is possible given the political will. Anything is possible. Human beings are immensely adaptable. I mean, you just have to look at, you know, look at the science. The, the, I mean, it may, it may very well have been science that caused this. Uh, if if it did, indeed it was the leakage of the virus out of the lab in Wuhan that caused the pandemic. But whatever about that, science has come up with the, with the, with the vaccine and the vaccines that hopefully will save us all. Um, so human beings are immensely adaptable and clever and intelligent, uh, given the right circumstances and the right political leadership and, and intelligence and everybody thinking ahead and futuring and not pasting. And so I, you know, it is possible, but as I said, I'm not a historical determinist, so I, I don't know any more than you do, Paul, whether it's possible, but it is whether it'll happen, but it is possible. Anything is possible. I guess uh, that's about as optimistic, uh, as optimistic a thing as anybody has been in the course of this uh, series, which is remarkable, given some of the experiences that you've described, uh, that, that you have covered as a journalist or as an author and uh, as a caseworker with the Hatton Lucan Centre over the last almost 40 years. Look, Anne, thanks very much indeed for joining us on the programme. Um, good luck. Thank you for you. asking me, Paul. Any future literary endeavours, uh, wish you good fortune with those. And thanks for sharing your thoughts with us on the, the, the line, the, the, the border between North and South here in the island or on the island of Ireland.